Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Hey, it's great to see you guys this morning. I'm so thankful for a warm Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. So would you stand with us? We're going to start off the morning with some worship.
good to be back with you. Would you bow your heads? Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we gather this morning and we declare that your, uh, your empty tomb displays your victory. And Lord, we gather here today recognizing that the redeemed has the great privilege to sing Jesus saves. And so we gather this morning to make much of him and what he has done upon the cross and his death and his resurrection. Lord, we can gather recognizing that in your grace, we are debtors and that all we can do is proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And so Lord, through these songs and through the reading of the scripture, the hearing of the word of God, I pray that you would tune our hearts to be more in love with him. We are grateful for all that he has done for us, all that he's done in us. We continue to pray for all the things that he will do through us. And Lord, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning and welcome to New Hope. There are a few things I want to draw your attention to here in the bulletin. I do want to remind you that uh, we're just about finished with the windows. The windows are set to go. We have our blinds coming in here soon. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to grab a window pane, perhaps I haven't had a chance to grab a window pane or two yet, uh, there are some still left available. Make sure you grab those as soon as you can. Also, you see some things going on this week. Of course, we have our midweek ministries Wednesday evening, as well as bridal shower for Adrian coming up this Saturday. And of course, our ladies and youth recipe night this Friday. Uh, Some of you, I know many of you have been praying for what's going on uh, overseas in Eastern Europe with what's going on in Ukraine and and Russia and the war there. I know we gathered for prayer last Tuesday night and we want to continue to pray for all that's going on. Obviously, obviously, there's a lot to be praying about. But I also recognize that there's more that we can be doing. And there's some information here in your bulletin that if you're interested in doing more than praying, such as giving, There's a great Christian organization that is partnering with churches right there on the front lines. I mean, right there, housing people who are fleeing, also housing people who have lost their homes, lost their families. Uh, There's a lot going on there, and we want to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as we want to continue to uh, minister however we can thousands of miles removed from them, but this is a great opportunity if you're looking to give above and beyond what you normally give. Uh, This is a great opportunity right here in the bulletin. You can read about that on how we can do that. Well, if you are a guest with us, I want to let you know we're glad that you're here. Right on the inside of the bulletin, there's a guest card. We'd appreciate it if you could take a moment and fill that out. You can actually tear that out. And then at the end of the service on your way out, there's two black giving boxes where we give. If you wouldn't mind just putting that in there, we'd love to have a record of your visit. We're glad you're here to worship the Lord with us. Well, let's continue to do that together. So, Noah, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, would you stand with us as we continue? Trouble surrounds
Our scripture reading for the month of March is found in the book of Romans in verses 1 and 2. Let me read it for us this morning and then we'll say it together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Let's say it together. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's always good to be reminded of what you have done for us, Lord that you have called us from being mired in sin, that you have cleansed us through the blood of your Son, God, and you have called us uh, to a relationship with you and to serve you. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, God. We pray that you would help us to live um, just with that knowledge that we will continue to be forgiving of others, that we will continue to, to just be so aware of the grace that we live in, Lord, that we can offer grace to others. So this morning, God, as Pastor Mike comes up here, Lord, I pray that you would open your word to us, that you would use him to teach us and uh, and change our hearts, 
to become more like your son. So again, we just offer this day to you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dismiss the preschoolers. Preschoolers, you can head on to your class. Your teacher is waiting for you there in the foyer. So preschoolers, head on out. I invite the rest of you to turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. And as you turn there, let me ask you a question. While you don't have to answer this out loud, you're welcome to answer this to yourself. Do you like change? Maybe a better way to ask it is, how much do you like change? A study was done of over 600 people uh, asked them questions regarding personal change, change in their own life. And two-thirds of the people who were asked simply said that the future and change about their future worries them. It concerns them. One-third of the people said that they would not continue if things changed, if they didn't see success in what they were doing. I found that interesting. It has a lot to say about perseverance and endurance. But simply said, one third of the people said that if there was a change, they would only continue if they saw success. Well, 40% of the people said that if there was change in their life and it didn't go well, they didn't believe they could accept failure. 40% said they could not accept failure. But yet at the same time, and I want you to notice this, 9 out of 10, that's 90% of the people believe that change was coming. That in the next five years, their lives will look totally different. Now, what do we do with these numbers and how do we translate all of this when it comes to change. Well, simply put, we know change is coming. And while we know change is coming, there's some discomfort to the idea of change. There's some uncertainty that change includes in our lives and perhaps it's fear that keeps us from embracing change. Well, today, as we study through the book of Genesis, we come to Genesis at the end of chapter 11, and we're going to begin chapter 12. The story is about change. Really, it's about a new beginning, a beginning for a man named Abram and his family. Now, as we have come so far in the book of Genesis, I want you to notice that today, begins a great transition. And if you're a student of the book of Genesis, you recognize that chapter 11 to chapter 12 is a big change. In fact, up to this point, in Genesis chapter 11, up to Genesis chapter 11, the subjects, really the stories, have been about specific events. All right, we've dealt with four major events up to this point. We have the creation Genesis 1 and 2 in which God took nothing and created everything. He simply spoke and created all things, his creation, his universe. And he did it in six days and then rested on the seventh. But not just creation. Soon after that, we have the fall. His first people in which he created Adam and Eve was given all this to enjoy, all of the garden, all the trees to enjoy all of God's creation. But of with this one tree, God said, do not eat, obey me, do not eat of this one tree, but instead enjoy all of that. They chose to know, disobey God, eat of that tree, and we have the fall of the human race. Genesis 3, we have the fall. Well, of course, we get to Genesis chapter 6, and as the people begin to multiply on the face of the earth, we saw that their rebellion against God got so bad that God, in his judgment, sent a worldwide flood and spared eight people, Noah and his family. Of course, last time in the book of Genesis, we saw in Genesis chapter 11, 
the Tower of Babel, where refusing to scatter, refusing to multiply and fill the earth, the people of the earth gathered, gathered there uh, in Babylon and decided to create a wonderful tower to themselves and make a name for themselves, a tower that would reach the heavens and draw down God because they wanted to be God themselves. But God said, no, that's not going to happen. Scattered them. And now we have different languages spread throughout all the world. And so the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis deal specifically with events. In fact, those events cover over 2,000 years of history. But now we're going to transition from Genesis chapter 11 to Genesis chapter 12. We're no longer going to focus on these big events, but instead we're going to focus on people. In fact, instead of the four events in the first 11 chapters, we're going to focus on four specific people. Abraham. In chapters 12 all the way to chapters 50, we, we see Abraham and his son, Isaac. Isaac's son, Jacob, and uh, Jacob's son, Joseph. Now, this next 39 chapters are only going to deal with about 350 years. And so the first 11 chapters, 2,000 years, and these huge worldwide events... Now these next 39 chapters, just 350 years, four specific people on about how God is going to build a nation. So let's begin in chapter 11, all the way at the end of chapter 11, jump down to verse 37, or excuse me, 27. It begins with a man named Terah. It says in verse 27 that these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahar, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Well, Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahar took wives. And the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahar's wife, Milcah, and the daughter, excuse me, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Now Sarah was barren. She had no children. Verse 31. So Terah took Abram, his son, Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years. Terah died in Haran. Now, to understand the power of God, specifically in the story of Abram, of course, we know he would have his name changed to Abraham, the story of Abraham, to understand the power of God in the life of Abraham, I think we need to understand a little bit about Abraham's history and even the context to, to know a little bit of the background. Because when you understand a little bit of the background of Abraham and his family, you can see the power of God on full display. It begins with his father, a man named Terah. Terah raised his family in a place called Ur, Ur of the Chaldeans. Think of modern day Iraq, southern Iraq. There, Terah raised his family. He had some sons, and you saw his sons listed here. Abram, Nahar, and Haran. Now, as they grew up in the city, Ur, we should know, was a big cosmopolitan city. It was a place where the world gathered to do trade. Uh, it was a commercial city. Now, as we know, with many commercial cities of the day, it invited travelers from all over the world. Now, what do we get when we have travelers from all over the world come in to a city? You get pluralis uh, pluralism in deities. You get all kinds of deities from around the world. And this is what Ur was like. Ur was a place where there was a lot of wealth, a lot of people, and a lot of gods. Now, with that, we should know that the book of Joshua says something very important about Terah and his family. In Joshua chapter 24, you don't have to turn there, but let me just tell you what Joshua said. Right before Israel is going to take hold of the promised land, in his last address to the people of Israel, Joshua looks at them and he recalls Israel's history. It's a special moment. He recalls how God has brought him this far 
and now where he's going to take them. But in this recollection, in this time of just reminding them about where they've come from, he says something important about Terah and his family. And he simply says this. He recalls to the people of God, uh, he says that Terah and Abraham in Ur worshipped the pagan gods. It's an interesting point. It's just one simple sentence, but here's the point that Joshua is making. Before God called Abram out of the land of Ur, out with his family to go to the land in which he will show him, Abram, Terah, and the whole family were worshipers of pagan gods. In fact, there's nothing that we would know of of They had ever even heard the story of the flood or the Tower of Babel. We don't know. All we know is they worshiped the pagan gods. And this is what went on in the land of Ur. Now it says here that Terah had these three sons. And we see that these three sons, Abram, Nahar, and Haran. It says that uh, down in verse 29, Abram and Nahar took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Of course, we see in verse 30 that she was a barren woman. Of course, you know the story of Sarai, whose name was later changed to Sarah, that she couldn't have children. She couldn't have children. Now, what's interesting is the name Abraham, which of course means exalted father, is married to a woman who can't have children. So Abram takes a wife, Sarai, It says, Nahar takes a wife, Milcah, and while that's not important now, it will be when it comes to uh, finding a wife for Isaac, but I want you to notice that there was another brother too, the other brother, Haran. What do we know about Haran? Well, we know a couple things, really two specific things. Haran fathered Lot. That's what it says here in verse 27. Haran was the father of Lot. But we see in the very next verse that Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of Ur, of the Chaldeans. Why these details given to us before we get to chapter 12? Mentioned in really the genealogy, if you will, of Terah. Why these specific details and why am I spending so much time on this? Uh, Because it is giving us a lot of information about the power of God. And his grace. I want you to notice that Abram came from a family that worshipped pagan gods. Abram suffered the loss of a brother. An untimely death. And it's very interesting in the phrase here that he died before his father. A lot of scholars have debated what could this mean that Haran died before in the presence of his father. What does that mean? Some translate it before, some say in the presence of his father. Well, let me share with you a little bit of Jewish tradition. Jewish tradition says that uh, Terah was a pagan priest and that he served and worshiped the pagan god, specifically the moon god, ironically named Sin. But they ser- he served as a pagan priest. He served all the different gods. And one day came home to find that uh, his business wasn't going well and blamed his sons, Abram and uh, Haran. And supposedly, some scholars say that he threw them into Nimrod's fiery furnace. And there, Abram was spared, but Haran died. Some believe according to Jewish history, that a Jewish tradition, that uh, uh, Haran was killed in the presence of his father. And of course, in the presence there could mean in the face of, or in the, in the presence of as if there was some kind of conflict. And, and I bring this up, but while we don't know for sure the details, we do know this, that Haran died an untimely death. And this could just be chronologically. Uh, I see the ESV translated as presence and maybe your translation if you're the new american standard new king james version or or some of the other uh, versions simply say before his father whether it was before his father as in chronologically he died at an early age or whether it was 
in the presence of his father, perhaps his father even killing his son by throwing him into a fiery furnace. We know this, and I want you to hear the point. The point is simply this. Abram lost a brother in an untimely fashion at an early age. And the reason this is important is because Abram suffered some loss. I mean, here is a man who knows not God, who lives in a family that worships and serves the pagan gods, who has suffered loss and perhaps has no idea how to even really embrace this or comprehend it. And if you, your family has ever suffered the loss of a loved one, there's no question that that changes the dynamic of the family forever. Some of you have suffered this loss. A brother or a sister. A child. And it's in those moments that everything changes. Well, here Abram, we see, is an idolater. An idolater in the family of idolaters. He suffered loss, pain, the loss of his brother. He's dealt with grief. And he has a wife, a wife who can't have any children. She's barren. In other words, you can see that this this man is not necessarily the good pick, humanly speaking, for God to pick to change the world. But yet God, and this is why I love the first three words of chapter 12. Look at this. It says, now the Lord. Isn't that powerful? So here you have this pagan who serves all kinds of gods, who has suffered great loss in his family, and his life is just, it's just existing, and it's not existing for the right purposes or reasons. He's married, but he can have no children. Of course, in this culture, what that means is your legacy ends with you. There's really nothing going on other than serving some pagan gods and making some money off them, and then all of a sudden, verse uh, chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now the Lord. How easily we can read over uh, chapter 11 and get to chapter 12 and just say, oh, well, now the Lord. But I want you to see, now the Lord. Now the Lord. I think it's important for us to recognize that, yes, yes, our family influences us. Doesn't it? Our family influences us both for the good and for the bad. Our family influences us. But I want you to know, please know, that your family history, like Abram here, your family history can suck you in and pull you down, or it can be a motivational, uh, really a chance for motivation, but a motivational tool for foundational change in which you can use to the glory of God. And so we're not here to deny how our family does influence us. But the question for you and I will be, for the both good and the bad of our family history is, will it suck us down and destroy our lives? Will it pull us down and hold us down? Or will it be motivation for foundational change to the glory of God? Because we can all make excuses. God is about to call Abram to a incredible new beginning. And there's no question in my mind that Abram could have had a lot of excuses about why he couldn't or why he shouldn't. He's got family in this land. This is what he knows. This is who he is. And and it says here, now the Lord. So let's read chapter 12, verses one through three. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I 
will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this is the beginning of what in a couple chapters will be confirmed as the Abrahamic covenant. God makes a covenant with this man that says, here are some things I will do. Which I think is an important part of the story. Because it's not about Abram's power. It's not about his special privilege and uniqueness that God would say, here's my guy. He's the one. No, he's the pagan who's serving all these different gods who has a messed up family. But God steps in and says, here's what I will do. And in fact, I would encourage you to take a little pen and underline all the times in those three verses, at least five times, God says, I will. Because it's not about the power and genius of Abraham, Abram, but it's about the power and genius of God. And he looks at Abram and says, here's some things I will do. I will bring you to a land. I will make your name great. I will bless the nations because of you. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who curse you. So this pagan idolater who can have no children, God says, yes, you will be an exalted father. You will have many children and I will make your name great. And through you, all the world will be blessed. And I'm gonna give you this land. This land will be yours. God says, I will do that. God's call is in his grace. He calls Abraham because of grace. It's grace. Not because he's privileged or deserved, because God is just gracious. And I find it incredibly awesome that it's Abram's disqualifications. He didn't deserve it. Not the kind of man you should pick. It's his disqualifications. And Sarai's disqualifications, she can't have children, that God uses their disqualifications as his tools for his purpose. It's, it's the fact that they can't do it, that God steps in and says, I will do it. He steps in and says, I will do these things. And I see too many believers many times thinking that their inabilities, focusing in on their failures, thinking that I can't do it. I'm too broken. My, my life's too much of a mess. Believers who are burdened down with past failures, Thinking my influence, I mean, who am I? My influence is too weak. Convincing ourselves that our age, we're, we're too old or we're too young. If you just knew me, the real me, then you wouldn't. Listen, God looks at all of this. And it's not because you are qualified and have a special uniqueness about you that God will choose to use you. But it's in spite of all of our disqualifications and failures and brokenness, that God looks and says, through you, I will. I will do great things for his sake. So we can look at our disqualifications and all the things that discourage us and recognize that these, if given over to God, if submitted, repented of, and submitted to God, God can use them as tools for his glory. I will do these things things and so here he has a man who he gives promises Abram is given is really has this encounter with God God says I'm going to do all these things and I wonder what was going on in Abram's mind and we can only speculate so we won't spend much time speculating but um there's a lot there to wonder what, what could he have been thinking? I think of Paul, right? Paul who 
did a lot of things that was not honoring to the Lord before God graciously called upon him to change the world. But this is what, this is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said this, talking about God, it says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul explaining how God has used him to change the world through the church of Jesus Christ simply says, listen, it's in my weakness that God's power is made perfect. So this morning, if you recognize that in your walk with the Lord and uh, there, there seems to be a little bit of weakness and struggle, if you look at your life and, and the routine of life has just turned into just simply this kind of normal, I'm, I'm struggling just for any kind of power, know this, in your weakness, the power of God may be put on display. This is why Paul could look in Philippians chapter three, verse 13, and say, I let go, forgetting the things that lie behind me, I reach forward to what lies ahead. And what lies ahead is simply this, me pressing on toward the goal of the call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm going to keep reaching forward to what lies ahead, leaving the past, there in the past, and simply step by step in faith, moving forward in the grace of God. After all, what really are we? What really are we? We are but a breath in our lungs, a vapor, a mist that is here and then gone. But who is he? The God of all the universe. And in his power and in his grace, he would call you, call you in salvation to be a trophy of his grace, to change you, to make you, to be like Jesus Christ, and then to influence the world for the name of his son Christ. Here in chapter 12, it's the beginning of what I said, what is known as the Abrahamic covenant. God graciously calls Abram. He says, I'm gonna make you a great nation. I will show you this land. You will be a blessing. You might see that and just say, well, that's nice. Abram's going to be a blessing. Like, bless your little heart. No, no, the, the blessing here, of course, is revealed in Romans chapter 9, where Paul says how Abram has blessed the world. You want to know what it is? It's the Jewish Messiah that has come through Abram. That through Christ... All the way, not just in chapter 3, verse 15, but all the way here, the thread of Christ here in the Abrahamic covenant that would be confirmed in Genesis 15, that I will bless the world through you, Abram. Hear this man, this pagan idolater who had a wife that couldn't have kids, is going to have all these nations of kids, is going to be a blessing to the world, that through him would come the Messiah? What a gracious, powerful God. Well, just as God calls in his grace, I want you to notice how we respond. We respond like Abram responded. And this is how you respond when God calls by his grace. And it's simply like this, in faith, in faith. When God calls in his grace, we respond with faith. Take a look at verse four. It says, so... Abram, he went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. And by the way, if you ever wondered why Lot's always kind of hanging around with Abram and Abraham as he moves across land, it's because he has no father. Abram seems to have taken on Lot as a child of his own. So we're going to see Lot involved in a lot of stories because Haran, his father, had died. And so he takes, Abram takes Lot with him. 
And it says here, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay, so he was in Ur. Now he's in Haran. Now, if you have this little map in your Bible, maybe at the front, or if you have a study Bible, it might be right there on uh, the page where chapter 12 is mentioned. Um, you see that southern Iraq, the Ur of the Chaldeans, that they travel up to the city called Haran. Now, again, true, Jewish tradition says that the land Haran there, that Terah named that land after his son. But they went up the Euphrates River. You might look at your map and wonder, why didn't they just go straight west? Why don't you just go to the land of Canaan? Why would you start in Ur, go way up here to Haran, and come all the way down here to the land of Canaan? And the, the, the answer is simple, that with the multitude of people that they were bringing, you can't just cut through the desert. They had to follow the river. And they go up to this land of Haran, where they seemingly stayed for a while. In fact, the book of Acts, when Stephen is once again recalling the history of Israel to the people of Israel... In Acts chapter 7, what Stephen does is he reminds them that it was the land of Haran where Terah dies, and then Abraham continues the call of God. So perhaps after being there several years, God either reminds or perhaps calls again Abram, but I want you to notice that it's by his faith that Abram responds, and he goes from the land of Haran. Verse 5 says, so Abram took Sarah, his, Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land of the place of Shechem, at Shechem, to the oak of Morai. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. And from there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. So Abram, he journeyed on, still going toward the Negeb, or maybe your translation says the south, there in the land of Canaan. Hebrews chapter 11 they attest all of this to the faith of Abraham. It says, by faith, God called by his grace, Abraham responded with faith. It says, by faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And so he went out, not knowing where he was going. And this is the call of God. I mean, if you think about this, this is, this is uh, pretty incredible that God said, go to a place in which I will show you. So it wasn't like, hey, I want you to go to this place. I have something waiting for you. He just said, I want you to leave. Begin going to a place. Well, God, where am I going? Uh, I will show you. But right now, I need you to go. And Abraham's response was, okay. By faith, he went. It says, by faith he went to, the, to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, the promise of God. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. So by faith, what did Abraham, Abram do? He went. A new beginning all of his life at this moment would be forever changed. And it wasn't like he could just jump in, jump in his car and head back to Ur if things didn't go well. He, didn't, he couldn't just go online and buy a plane ticket and say, well, I'll, I'll just head back home. He, by faith, took a step, then took another step. And he headed to a land in which God will show him. And then when they got there, God said, now look, look at this land. This land is the land I promise to give you and your descendants. Believers, there's no question about it that as we look upon God's call in our life, if he has saved you, if you have turned from your sins and placed your faith in Christ, God has called you to a new beginning in him. What that means is you are born again, 
saved by his grace. And our only response is to live by faith. In fact, the book of Hebrews says, it's, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if you're, you're looking with the desire to please God, know this, it requires faith. It requires faith. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven says, we walk by faith, not by sight. Thus is the motto of the believer. Doesn't make sense to the world, but we know that we have a God who has saved us. And by his grace, we now simply walk by faith. We believe upon him. It means for some, that's huge, life-changing moments where you stake a flag into the ground and say, at this moment, by faith, I will no longer head this way. I'm starting a new beginning. Things are changing. Things are changing in our home. Things are changing in our life. Things are changing. And I'm going to, by faith, simply walk with the Lord in obedience. And by faith, you head out to a new path, a new beginning. For others, it's just simply, I walk by faith, step by step. It might not be these huge life-changing moments where everything in your life changes, but instead, by faith, you walk step by step. Uncertain about what the future may hold, it doesn't concern you. It doesn't bother you. You just simply walk step by step in faith, believing him. Believing him. All of this, simply a promise from God. Promise from God. And I know we can sing about the promises of God. We talk about the promise of God. But I want you this morning, in our last few minutes, I want you to think, meditate upon the promises of God. I, I recognize I recognize that as believers that some of our things, some of the, I guess you would say, some of the common things we do with the promises of God is usually we find some Old Testament leader or some Old Testament prophet and see a promise that was given to them and claim it for ourselves. And I'm here to tell you, we don't have to do that. All right, we don't have to look and look at all the promises God gave Jeremiah or Joshua and say, those are my promises. Listen, God has given you so many promises as a believer that I thought about just reading all of them, but we didn't have that much time. So what I did was I just, I begin to just grab a couple of my favorites from the New Testament. And as I read them, what I want to do is I want you to think about the reality of God's promise he has given to you if there's a condition there. If you are a genuine, regenerated believer in Jesus Christ. All right, if you've, you've never come to faith in him, these promises do not apply to you. But if you are his, I want you to hear them and recognize that these are a reality in your life. Matthew chapter 11 says, come to me, all of you who are labor, all of you who labor and who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew chapter 28, of course, we know this is the Great Commission. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things in which I've commanded you. And then he simply says this, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of age. So as a believer, know this. From now and forever, the Lord is with you. And he will never be farther away and even in moments of doubt, perhaps even fear, or when it seems like, God, where have you gone? You can know that I am with you always, even to the end of age. James chapter 1, verse 5. It's been one of my favorites since I was young. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, sometimes when you're young, as a young man, you can lack some wisdom. 
He says this, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Look at this problem. Look at this problem, promise. Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. <laughs> this is an incredible promise of God. You want wisdom? God says, simply ask. Ask and he'll give. Philippians chapter four, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Do you understand what God just said? When it comes to anxiety and fear, that by faith, which is our response, by faith as we believe him, how do we know we believe him? We lift up our request to him. What does he do? He responds with giving us a peace. Doesn't make sense. It surpasses all understanding. And then what does he do? He guards our hearts and our minds. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. Another wonderful promise of God, that in your affliction, God comforts. Why? Because he's the God of all comfort. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Here's the, here's the promise God gives. If you're in affliction, go to him. He promises to comfort. Romans chapter 8. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. To those who are called according to his purpose. That we can look at every detail of our life and know that God's working in those details. For what? For our good. To make us more like Christ. Maybe not how we wanted them to work out, but for our good before. Philippians 1 verse 6. I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That once God starts working in a heart, he doesn't stop. And then once he's worked and saved you, that you're not going to walk away and lose it all and mess it all up, that he's going to continue to work and work on and work and eventually bring it to completion. Glorification. James chapter four, listen to this promise. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You don't have to spend so much time worrying about the devil. Just flee him and draw near to God. If you'll draw near to God, here's God's promise. He will draw near to you. So if you feel far off from God, if you wonder perhaps where he's been or what's going on or his thoughts about you, know this, draw near to him. And his promises, he will draw near to you. First John chapter one, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Perhaps one of the verses that requires some of the most faith. That in my sins, I can confess them and he actually forgives me and cleanses me. And we'll close with this, John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him Here's the promise, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Have everlasting life. The promises of God are to be received by faith. Believers, trust them, embrace them, think steadily upon them. So much of our minds can be conformed to this world in the pattern, ways of thinking. It just breeds doubt and worry and fear and all the things that we see on the nightly news. But if you will accept these, believe upon these by faith, know that God has promises these things. Listen, 
Your life will be forever changed. Your perspective, it'll be a new beginning. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If God's called you by grace, your response is faith. And I want you to know this right now. If you've never trusted Christ as your savior, you've never placed your faith fully in him. Maybe you've been to church. Maybe you've even been baptized. Maybe you've walked the church hallways and done the religious things. I want to ask you, has God genuinely saved you? Have you turned from your sin and placed your faith in him and in him alone? If you're here thinking, I've kind of messed these things up and my life's not perfect and, and we, have, we all have excuses. If God's calling you by his grace, your response is simply this. By faith, believe in him. Trust him to be your savior. How you do that is just simply where you're at, where you're sitting in the quietness of your own heart. Confess, confess your sin. Be honest with him. Plead with him that you need him. And then rest in what he has done upon the cross. That Christ in his death, paying the penalty for your sin and then rising again, his death and his resurrection is enough. That you can be saved. Not because we are worthy, but because he's a gracious God. Believe that. If you are a Christian here this morning, I encourage you to hold fast to the promises of God. Recognize that every day is a new beginning in your walk with him and how you represent him. Hold fast to those promises and step by step, we walk by faith, not by sight. Keep trusting him. Father, we come to you and we say thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for these promises in which you declared that I will that we can trust that you will do these things, not only for Abram, but in the life of every believer, the promises you've given to us. Lord, the comfort it gives us, the peace it gives us, the hope. Lord, I pray that every day as we begin our day, we would just simply rest in you, believe upon you, and walk faithfully, representing you well. Lord, for the one here today who needs to place their faith in Christ, needs a new beginning. God, will they take a step in faith? Trust you. So thank you, Lord, for these words you've given us. God, I pray that you would uh, strengthen our faith. Help us. Help us when we doubt, when we place our eyes upon Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close. So we we'll close with this song. I want you to know there'll be leaders down front. If you need prayer, if there's something going on in your world, in your life, perhaps you've trusted Christ and you want to tell us about it or just tell us about something the Lord's doing in your heart, there'll be leaders down front and we can pray with you.
just saying for my savior loves me so he will hold me fast as you look at your own life and your walk with him keep walking by faith step by step knowing that he holds us fast and i want you uh to remember we have our bible fellowship classes if you're looking for a class uh we can find you a good class to get involved with just find me here in the foyer as we head out to our classes noah would you close us in prayer please yeah would you pray with me Dear thank you father Lord, we love you god i thank you for the promises that we have in store through you. And I just ask that you give us a better understanding, a stronger faith and stronger belief, because if we really understand those promises and we really have a a belief in you, that you will come through and and do the things that your word says you will do, our life will be greatly changed. It can only provoke us to act in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you, God. So help us to desire that and to... um, to want to know you better. God, as we go this week, I ask that you continue to bless us and help us to be a great example for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.